Furthermore, the equation E is equal mc squared. And here's the discovery. I'm gonna make them an offer again. Hello and welcome to another Cheeky Scientist radio podcast. I am Isaiah Hankel with Cheeky Scientist. We have a great show for you today. This is the radio show for PhDs who want to get hired into their first or next job in industry, and who want to thrive in business. Thank you for joining us. Here we go. Okay, so we are going to jump into our very first section here. It looks like everybody can see us and hear us. Thank you for joining us. Today's show is all about industry R&D positions. And so we're going to start with some data on industry R&D by country. And to do this, I'm going to first bring on, I'm going to bring on all of our team members here first to say hello. And then Jeanette's going to be with us as we walk through uh, this show me the data section. So we have Mary on here. Mary Truscott. Hello, Mary. How are you? I'm great, Isaiah. How are you? I think you're Hi, on everyone. mute or I'm on, or I have you on mute. I'm not sure. Let's see. Can, can you hear me now? Nope, it's hello? just me. Let me do this. Oh, Nalani you... hears me. There we go. I can hear you now. Hey, Nalani. Hey, everyone. Oh, and who else are we having? Nalini, Lisa, are you coming on? You too scared? I know Jeanette's coming on. Let's see if we can get Jeanette on. Oh. Uh, I can hear you. Let me see. There we go. Hi, okay. Hey. There we go. Thanks for joining. And uh, we also have uh, uh, Lisa and Nalini in the chat box, so you can talk to them as well. If they want to pop on, they can. Um, but we're going to keep on Jeanette and we're going to jump into the show me the data section. Mary will be on with us a, a bit later as well. So great to have both of you on. Jeanette, thanks for being with us. Let's jump into this first figure here. Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, I can. If you're a member joining us on Zoom, can you type in yes in the chat box if you can see our screen as well, please? All right, great. So how much does your country invest in R&D? I love this figure. I'm gonna let Jeanette walk us through it and then we'll talk about some of the, some of the reasons this figure is important. Yeah, great. So this figure is, shows the amount of money that different countries are spending on R&D. And they've broken it down in a couple of different ways. So the size of the circle, so there's a bunch of circles on this graph, and the size of the circle indicates the amount of money that they've spent um, in purchasing power, so basically like in dollars, how much money they've spent. And then on the x-axis, they've looked at the amount of R&D that they spend as a percent of their country's GDP. And then they've got another piece of data on this graph, which is the y-axis, and that shows the number of researchers uh, per million inhabitants of the country. Mm. Yeah, Alex says, uh, this graph is so pretty. I agree. I really like this, this chart. And, uh, you know, as you heard, it's, it's showing really three different things, right? The size of the bubble is how much they invest in R&D. Uh, the y-axis, researchers per million inhabitants, and, and x-axis, R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP. Now, in the center, you have countries that are probably very familiar to you in terms of the amount of investment that they've done in R&D, the amount of R&D they do overall, et cetera. They're kind of right in the middle of the chart. Um, the biggest circle in the middle, the biggest circles in the middle are the United States, Germany, France, Japan. Um, but we also have in the middle, Singapore, France, uh, I said France, ne Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, Switzerland. I can't read this red one in the middle. Sweden, Finland, Denmark. And uh, higher towards the, the upper right-hand corner, we also have Israel and, and Korea. Uh, China is a very big circle. Uh, so why does this matter? You also have the United Kingdom, Canada, of course, Norway. Why does this matter? It may, you know, as you hear these names of these different countries, the, there's a lot of R&D going on in these countries, whether you're looking at it as, as you know, people doing R&D uh, as a percentage of the population or a percentage of the GDP or how much they're investing. This is where a lot of the R&D jobs are going to be. And we see a lot of PhDs going to these countries to work um, in R&D. But there's R&D going on. 
and Malaysia and Brazil, uh, India, of course. And uh, this is this is great for all of you who are in the association. We've helped PhDs get into R and D roles in all of these countries. And uh, yeah, sure, there's more PhDs getting hired into R and D roles in the countries that are, you know, higher up on the chart or with larger bubbles. Um, but it just shows that there's a lot of different countries hiring for these positions. Any other conclusions to draw from this, Jeanette? Um, yeah, I think you, you brought up most of the really great points about this. And um, I think if you scroll down, we'll just take it to the next step, which is um, they broke down the actual amount of money and percentage mm. of these bubbles, right? So we, in that figure, the only annoying thing about it is it doesn't actually tell you how big the bubble is, like what that means in terms of dollars. And here is where that is in this next right. little section, right? Where you can see that for the US, their total spending was uh, $478 billion on R&D. And the really interesting part of this is that a huge majority of that comes from the business sector, right? So it was 71% of that $478 billion was spent by businesses, right? Not the government spending, but businesses. Yes. And, and and right. So I think, you know, we, a lot of us, we want to, we're thinking in terms of the breakdown, right? How much research is going on in academia, government, nonprofit, dollar amounts, it's in industry. And you see this practically too, right? I, I remember in graduate school, one of the postdocs uh, went and worked, uh, transitioned into an industry job, was one of the few at the time that did. And we were still kind of in touch with him. We talked to him and he said, it's amazing. You know, I had this one 10 year old broken down instrument in the lab that I was sharing with like three other labs in academia. Now I have three of the newest models of that in instrument, just in case the first two break and they're all, this is what we see more and more. And that's why there's a lot more of the money there, a lot more of the um, investment there. You know, in academia, you probably heard the phrase publish or perish. Uh, there's a corollary of that in industry where it's innovate or die. And companies know this, which makes you, you know, very valuable to companies because they need people to innovate. And as we're going to see uh, with Jeanette, as we go through the rest of, of the show me the data section, uh, companies want to hire you f exactly for that, your innovation skills and in a variety of different countries. So on to that data, uh, Jeanette, I love this figure that you, this is a 2018 R&D trends forecast. All right, this is from IRI web. And what it's looking at here is just a list of characteristics, traits, things that companies really care about. Is that right? Do you wanna walk us through, I guess, exactly what these, um, these descriptive terms are answers to? Yeah, so they asked what the um, respondents, you know, these people working in R&D, what are their top concerns? What are they worried about for the future? What keeps them up at night was kind of the phrase that they used. And so these are the things that they really need to like fix for their future, right? For the future of their companies. And they had them rate it like a top concern, a second and a third. And so that's rated on this graph um, that you see here with the different colors where the darkest color is the top concern, the lightest color is the second co concern, and then the medium gray color is um, the third concern. Yes. Um, and you can see the graph shows all these different concerns. And the biggest one that they had was balancing short and long-term objectives, mm. right? And that to me means strategic vision right? How are they making strategic choices on the ground every day that also match with the long-term goals of the company, right? And what's really interesting about this top concern is it has nothing to do with the technical skills that you would bring to a company. It's all about the way that you would think and make business decisions, right? Mm -hmm. And so these are the types of uh, questions and concerns that really are what in industry R&D is looking at. And the next one is the same, right? So maintaining an innovation culture, like you just said, innovate or die, right? Mm. And then the next one is the same where it's integrating tech planning and business strategy together, right? Mm. So they need people who are able to help them with these issues. Like you need to come to them with more than just your technical skills, your technical savvy, but yeah. also bring with you um, some business acumen that, you, that they can rely on. 
Yeah. Uh, and I think that's why this is so important because as PhDs, we think that and they're looking for the same thing as what my role was in academia. No, no, not, not at all, really, right? You know, whether it's you're pushing a pipette because you're working at a, a wet lab in, you know, more of the life sciences or, you know, even if you're programming or whatever it is, there's, there's uh, you know, machines, robotics that can do a lot of this stuff and are doing it in industry. I remember walking through the first lab uh, in my first site visit and I was amazed by how few people were in the labs and how many robots and like chains of, you know, robotics were there, right? Like, so like mass ELISAs and screens and everything were, were being done by uh, essentially custom built robotics in many cases. And so you just have to think about that. You know, your value is your ability to think innovatively, to come up with new ideas, to strategize. And that's what they're looking for. Get the full list here. Number two, building, maintaining an innovative culture. Number three, integrating tech planning and biz strat strategy. Number four, attracting, developing, and retaining talent. Number five, gaining management support for tech innovation. Moving on, identifying disruption. Globally, measuring R&D performance, right? What you don't see on here is Western blotting or uh, you know, doing ELISA's. Or, you know, uh, being able to, you know, write XYZ code. Whatever you're doing, uh, think about it in terms of what is the human element that they need. The strategy, the creative process, the decision making, uh, the, you know, the innovative ideas, the creativity. That's what they're looking for. And so, this is really important when you start selling yourself through your resume to put these kinds of transferable skills on your resume Our special guest today about this, right? What parts of the interview process, the job itself, are not really technical in the classical sense, but are more transferable, are more uh, business acumen. So moving forward, I just love that figure. Great, great insights there. Um, we're looking at top innovation tactics for the next three years. So different question, right? The question here, Jeanette, was what are the top innovation tactics uh, over the next three years, and and what were the results? Yeah, so how are they maintaining that culture of innovation? How are they pushing that forward, right? That was their second concern of the previous mm -hmm. graph. Um, and we see that what they are planning to do is look at developing things in-house, right? But what really struck me was that the two of those top three things involve collaborations, right? Mm -hmm. So they're looking to make more collaborations both in industry and with academic institutions. Um, and so they're going to need people who know how to work in collaborative environments, right? And make these collaborations and build relationships. Um, but the most exciting was the fourth one on the list, which it said that more than 40% of the people um, in this survey said that one of their top innovation tactics is to hire new people, right? So they yeah. are looking for new, fresh people who can bring innovative ideas to their companies. And that is PhDs. That is who you are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, we talk about today's economy where more PhDs are being hired than ever before and where the bulk of them are being hired is into R&D positions. Um, and, and so you just have to understand that just understanding how to be hired is a transferable skill that matters and that they're looking for, right? Just understanding how to actually go through the interview process, understanding what a day in the life of somebody on the industry side looks like. And we have you covered with all of those things today. We're going to talk with three, again, three different R&D professionals uh, in different positions. The last figure here before we bring on our first guest, Lillian, uh, is PhD salaries in the United States. This is just great. Actually, it was so great. I posted it on our, a lot of our social media platforms today. Because it shows, you know, postdoctoral fellow, average of about 48,000. And then you have, you know, uh, research associate, which is what they call postdocs after they've been a postdoc for five or six years and it starts to look bad for the university, right? About the same price uh, uh, as well. But then you see principal scientist, 145,000, right? This is an industry, of course. Scientist, note the general term, okay? Whether you're a chemist or a physicist, social scientist, whatever, like often it's just gen the title is generally scientist. We'll come back to that later. 93,000. Um, data scientist, 127,000. So some of these are academic, the others are industry. In general, when you look at the averages across the board, you're making at least twice as much in industry as you are 
in a postdoc, obviously much more than with a PhD stipend, and substantially more even if you're an associate or assistant professorship, uh, you know, 30% more. And you can get into those roles much faster. We're going to talk to Lillian, who went right into a, a senior scientist role uh, after getting her PhD uh, here shortly, and who's currently in a principal scientist position. So any final words on, on the data here, Jeanette, that we should take with us? No, I think you've, you've done a great job with this one. It's basically just looking at being, you know, like recognizing that this is the numbers. I mean, this, these are the numbers. That was terrible grammar. These are the numbers. And, um, you know, it's sometimes hard to adjust and to accept, but that's what's happening. And you are worth this amount of money just in a different place than where you are now. Absolutely. The only thing that's holding you back is, is employer's ability to find you. Uh, and we're going to talk about that too. So thank you very much, Jeanette, for your time. Uh, that's the end of the show me the data section. Please say thank you to Jeanette, wherever you're watching us. And we're going to jump right into our first guest. Very excited to have Lillian on. I haven't talked to Lillian for quite a while. Uh, Lillian came to one of our very first Cheeky Scientist Summits. Uh, she, is a, uh, she completed her PhD at the University of Delaware and currently works as a principal chemist at Ecolab. She has five plus years experience working closely with biotech CMC industry scientists from Genetech, Abbott, and Momentive. Uh, currently, she helps make the world a cleaner, safer, and healthier place by inventing and developing, developing hand care products that are designed uh, for people. She helps clean uh, for people and companies. She helps clean 40 billion hands each year. Very amazing. I'm going to show her LinkedIn profile here. Please connect with Lillian. We call this the, the hug of death because Lillian's going to have to answer a lot of connection requests. But make sure you send her a message. Uh, send her something about uh, one of her answers. Uh, of today, uh, based on today's questions, and we're going to bring on Lillian now. Hello, Lillian. How are you? I think you're on mute. Let me see if I can unmute you. There we go. Can you hear me? Hi. Can you hear me? I can now. It's great to see you. Thanks for joining us. Great to see you again. You're right. It's been so long since we talked. It has been. How have things been? How How's the career going? Good. Good. Um, I've actually have been a, having a very busy day, but happy to be joining you guys on the radio show. I really appreciate that. Yeah, we have a lot of people watching. We're doing a, a live stream here. So, so many people are interested in R&D positions in industry, but there's a lot of misconceptions about what that means. So I want to talk to you about the day in the life of people in industry. But first, I thought to ask you, why did you pursue, pursue this career track right after getting your PhD? Actually, I wanted to do research uh, R&D career before I started grad school. Uh, it's one of those uh, R&D internships when I did when I was an undergrad that I love. I fell in love with. It was an academia lab that I fell in love with. Uh, it was a momentous industrial lab that said, "Well, we love you, but." Uh, we can't hire you with only an undergrad degree. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I will do a, I will do a PhD in this. So. Wow. Yeah. So, so basically you're saying PhD, getting the PhD opened more doors for you in industry R and D. Certainly. Uh, because this is personal view, but I think having a PhD will lead you further into the career. Um, if you want to make it to mm. director level or um, VP levels of uh, technical, you know, companies, uh, the PhD is mm. really an asset and a value. Mm. And you went right from getting your PhD right into industry, correct? That is correct. I started at L'Oreal. Yeah. That's right. And I bring that up because there's this misconception that you need to do a postdoc to get into a scientist position at a big company or to get into a senior position. But you're an example that you do not. You can transition right from getting your PhD into an industry scientist position. Yes, that is correct. And I think too long a postdoc will actually prevent you from joining a company because they would be very confused as to which level they would put you in terms of being a scientist. Um, because after you know three to five years, um, companies start to hire from within or, you know, poach from other companies. And so having a really long postdoc, uh, whether it's at one location or multiple locations, will affect uh, your job prospects. Yeah, and, and we've seen the data on this. There's a great, for those of you listening, there's a great article in Nature Biotechnology that shows that if you do a postdoc, you'll never catch up 
um, you know, salary in terms of salary trajectory or career trajectory. Now, if you're, you've done a postdoc, don't freak out. You can use it to your advantage. You know, we can help you with that. But here's the way to think about it. Like once you know you want to go into industry, don't do another postdoc or don't start a postdoc. Okay. The time is now. Don't worry about what you've done in the past. Just worry about where you are now and, and what you need to start prioritizing. So there's a, there is again, a big misconception between what industry R and D is like. So maybe you can just start by comparing it um, some of the differences between academic R&D, given your experience, and, and what industry R&D is like? That's a great question. Um, academic R&D is pretty in-depth. Um, you're really trying to get to the mechanism of which this thing works, whether it's, you know, cell biology or microbiology or, you know, like me, uh, more on the chemistry side of things. But Really, in uh, industry, it's more about pushing the product out. Um, do they care about why it works? Maybe, but that is not the point uh, of, of your research here. Your research is to um, promote or push a product uh, out to the market, uh, whether that's you know, three years down the line or 10 years down the line in drug development. Uh, but nobody cares how much time you want to spend in it to, to, to find out why it works. They don't care why, they just want to make money. <laughs> it, it sounds like a very optimistic uh, and it's definitely a change in view going from academia lab to R&D lab, uh, but, but that is the truth, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and, and we see a lot of that. And I, I like the, the fact that you broke it down into mechanism, right? So academia might obsess with mechanism and industry. It's something you might want to figure out later if it leads to other treatments or cures, et cetera. Um, what about the, the, even the more practical things like the, uh, the financial support, the instrumentation, the uh, robotics, the, how people listen to you, maybe they respect you differently, some of those aspects. Certainly. Yeah. Um, in my company, or, and actually in both of my jobs, a PhD is fairly rare. Um, and so having that title gives you a different voice, um, mm -hmm. to put, put it at least. And now some people might interpret that differently, um, but I, I want to think of people want to listen to me because I have a PhD. Uh, and I did, yeah, hear about you talking about the robotics and automation and things. Uh, we do have pretty new, brand new stuff uh, in the labs here. I, when I was in grad school, I had to build a temperature control stage for a microscope, which you could buy for $6,000, but I spent half a year trying to build that. Whereas, you know, here, if I really need it, just put a requisition in, get your manager to approve it, and it will be here the next week with a technical sales or application scientist attached to it to help you install it or answer any questions. Um, so it's been really nice working in industry r and I don't think I would ever want to go back to academia lab to, <laughs> to the old basement uh, with crummy 20-year-old equipment. Yeah, and, I, and that's fair. I mean, those of you listening should pay attention to that because it makes a difference in the quality and the speed of work um, that you can do. Uh, I, I also want to talk a little bit about your, I mean, we've talked a little bit about your trajectory right into a senior scientist, and now you're at a principal scientist position, which is a, a very elevated position. I want to talk about your keys to success in a minute, but I also want to understand what you do on a daily basis. All right, so you're in R&D. How much of your time is in meetings or strategizing, uh, you know, maybe you could think of like a typical week and help us get some insight on what you, what you do. Good question. Cause this week I was mostly in meetings and strategizing. Uh, <laughs> uh, my lab time has significantly decreased over the past year. Um, it went from about 70% of the time in lab to about maybe a quarter of my time in lab. Um, mostly now I direct uh, even though I'm not their direct supervisor, I direct uh, other teammates to, to do the work um, or technicians uh, to do the work uh, in lab. Um, and then I spend about the other 25% of my time in meetings typically. Uh, the other 25% of the time is data analysis uh, and, or, and or presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the last 25% is actually related to clinical research, uh, which is not how usual R&D scientists work, um, but 
mm. my position is a little different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that's important because a lot of you may be so in the weeds, used to doing the very tactical, technical work that you can't even imagine yourself doing a bit more strategic work. And when you start in your first position, right, you might be, you're going to be doing, you might be doing some lab work and then some strategy, but very quickly you can get into a more strategic position. And that's a move you have to make. I always want to encourage PhDs to see themselves as strategists and managers and learning that kind of side of it, the, the management side, the business acumen side, it's right there for you. You have the training you need to do it. You can be managing people with their masters or their bachelors, the, you know, the, the, the pure technicians. Uh, so it's good to hear that uh, from Lillian. Yeah, one more thing I wanted to add about meetings, um, going from academia to industry, you will have a lot more meetings. Uh, in mm. industry than you ever had in your entire grad school slash postdoc uh, time. Um, it's not only for strategizing, you're just collaborating with so many more people than you have when you're in a school system. I mean, at most you're collaborating with one or two other professors and groups. Uh, but here I'm interacting with regulatory group, with the microbiology team, mm. with the analytical team who's running all of this, um, with the QC, with pilot plan, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you need to keep everybody on the same pace and hence all of these meetings. Uh, I do hear sometimes, you know, some PhDs come out and, oh, my goodness, there's so many meetings. Well, it's a necessary part of the evil. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I, I think, you know, it's, it's not, it's something we all have experience with, whether it's a lab meeting, journal club, et cetera. Um, you can see the value in it though, because you have to interact with people face to face. That's something that mm -hmm. can't be automated, out, automated or outsourced yet, right? You interact with people, you understand what they want, uh, and, and then you can uh, get larger things done, especially when those meetings involve other people and other departments, like you said, regulatory, et cetera. So mm -hmm. I do want to talk to you a little bit about getting into these roles, but maybe the best way to do that is to talk to you about the keys to your success. So how did you get right into a senior scientist role? How did you get into a principal uh, a scientist role so quickly? What do you think looking back really helped your career trajectory, helped you get in, you know, transition in the first place, then helped you climb the ladder? Well, to get into that first job, um, the experience uh, in my internship certainly helped. Um, and then having a PhD, they equate that to five years of experience. Uh, and I do know not every company do that, but especially since I joined a big company, they do realize that a PhD is not just pooling, it is years of experience. Um, so that certainly helped because uh, that's five plus years of experience right there. Uh, and then to move from the senior scientist position at L'Oreal to principal scientist at Ecolab here, uh, I had an additional years of experience um, and now I'm more familiar with the industry. Um, but I think what really, you know, sealed the deal was uh, me showing that I have that innovative capability mm. uh, and also the presentation capability because those two go together because if you can't present or communicate, then it doesn't matter how innovative or creative or smart you are. Uh, nobody else would understand it. Uh, so because I bring in so many different types of industry background, um, for the chemistry, uh, I was able to leverage some of those experience into the product development pipeline we have now in Ecolab. Um, and so I think that's really what marked my success in the transition. Mm. No, and that's very helpful. And I think for a lot of you listening, you know, a lot of this, the things that Lillian just talked about were related to transferable skills, business acumen, um, being able to showcase yourself as, as somebody who's worth investing in for the long term, who can do the strategic work, who can do the management work, uh, et cetera, you know, and your PhD is very valuable in this respect, you know, whether it can uh, equal, you know, quantitatively five years of experience or just the way that you are viewed qualitatively uh, definitely matters and you should leverage that, not hide it. I do want to ask you one more question about how much you care about clean hands. You care so much that you apparently make soap. Is this true? 
Well, that is literally the product uh, we make at Ecolab. And so, yes, so my hobby that comes into play uh, when securing this particular job. Uh, but it's still chemistry, and I really do enjoy the chemistry. Uh, I, could, I care about clean hands, and all of you uh, on the video, you should be singing happy birthday twice when you wash your hands, and also use a paper towel when opening bathroom doors. Please, please, and thank you. <laughs> so, so to stop uh, infections all around the place. So, yeah. Wow. And do you, so do you make your own soap too? Uh, so now I have stopped making my own soap, mostly because I've been so busy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I get to make it at work, so I don't need to do it that's at home great. anymore. But you can do it on your own. That's pretty. That's a. That's quite the skill. I will. Um, I'll have to get a special Lillian made bar of soap one day. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind sending one over. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Lillian, for your time. Really appreciate it. Please thank Lillian in the chat box uh, for her time as well. Thank you. Feel free to to connect to Lillian online and uh, wish her all the best in her uh, soap making uh, endeavors. Thank you, Lillian. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Are you looking to get your first or next job in industry? You can go to CheekyRadioBonus.com right now and get our free bonus that's for this podcast episode specifically. You have to go to CheekyRadioBonus.com right now to get this bonus because after this week, the bonus expires. Every week we have a brand new bonus. So if you want this week's bonus, go to CheekyRadioBonus.com and we will send you a free bonus that will help you in your job search and help you thrive in business now. Okay, so we're going to move right along to our very next guest. I'm going to show uh, our guest here, Evan. Evan completed his PhD at the University of Sherbrooke in Chemical and Biotechnological Engineering. Currently works as an Associate Research Scientist at PBD, developing pharmacokinetic and immunogenicity assays with, wow, big words here, multi-immunological -immun platforms, including uh, ELISA and uh, mesoscale discovery. And Evan has a LinkedIn page here, which I'll show you as well. You can reach out to Evan, but if you do, send him a kind message about, it, about him being on the show today. Evan is a, a cheeky scientist associate. You can see his badge here. And has just been uh, an incredible member that's encouraged a lot of other people. Uh, Evan is joining us by audio today, audio only. Uh, so we're going to bring Evan on now, and I'll make sure that we can uh, hear him. Let's see. Are you there, Evan? Hi, Isaiah. How are you? Good. How are you? It's good to see you. Yeah, you the same. It was I nice mean, to hear Lillian's hear voice you. too. I, I still remember. <laughs> yeah, I still um I still remember doing those small R and D group discussions with you and Lillian and a few other cheeky scientist associations. It's bringing back good memories. That's right. Was that two years ago? Three years ago? Jeez. I think it was about two or three years ago. Yeah, it was when you first started them. I think. Yeah. And now you're now you're here. Now you're in industry. Associate research. Yeah, scientist. yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How are things going? What's your favorite part of working in industry so far? Um, so far, I would have to say it's the um, this is pretty general, but it's got to be the collaborative effort, you know, between um, between your colleagues and your clients. Um, so it's a um, you know, PPD is a CRO, a contract research organization. So you know, we hmm. so I find myself collaborating quite closely with my colleagues here at work, and then quite closely with my clients um, who consist of small and the smallest and the very largest of the biopharmaceutical and pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, for a lot of you, if you're wondering what a CRO is, it's a contract research organization. They're growing exponentially. In fact, more PhDs are hired into CROs now than uh, big pharma or pharmaceutical in general, which is amazing. And uh, it's, so it's great to have Evan's viewpoint on, you know, what might be different as an R&D scientist in a, in a CRO. So, you know, I always want to start with why, Evan. Why did you want to stay in R&D in industry? Um, in industry, well, I guess I've just always had a, a natural affinity for science. Um, so I wanted to stay in research and development, um, you know, regardless if it was academia or industry. Um, and I think like many of the listeners here and many Cheeky Scientist Association members, um, I saw that the academic career path was certainly not sustainable by any means. Um, so I wanted to continue the, you know, the core science, which I'm very passionate about. It's more of a hobby for me than a job. 
And uh, so I felt, you know, doing that in industry is certainly a sustainable career. And uh, that's very much uh, how I wanted, where I wanted to go. And I really made the the biggest, um, I guess, kind of event for me to really make the decision to want to go to industry is when I attended the, um, I believe it was the 2014 uh, Immunogenicity Summit uh, in Baltimore, not too far from where I am now. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really taken aback by all these, um, you know, huge pharmaceutical companies uh, were sitting in this small room together. I was kind of more of an observer from academia. I, you know, I got some scholarship money to go and um, attend it. And I was just really taken aback by the um, the collaboration between scientists from competing companies, you know, trying to, you know, make better immunogenicity assays, you know, make um, drug candidates safe for the mm-hmm. patient. Um, and so I was just really taken, uh, inspired by that, uh, collaboration. And, um, you know, I just, I kind of saw that, you know, the end goal was, that was kind of like, you know, how neat would it have been to, you know, work on one of these drug candidates that ends up actually being, you know, like a, a, a major drug on the market now helping people or saving lives. You know, I thought it would really be a inspiring feeling, you know, a feeling of, you know, like winning the Super Bowl or something. So, you know, I really wanted to be involved in something where that could be a, a reality. So that's really what, um, that's really what propelled me to really start looking for a, a R and D scientist p- position specifically, um, and in industry. And, and now that you are in industry in that position, how have you been able to have more of an impact in on the industry side than in academia? Um, well, you're. Um, it's really. I guess I have to to answer that question. I really have to look at like the end result um, of academia versus. Um, industry. Um, the end result of academia that I worked in was you publish a paper and it, you know, it goes into PubMed and that's, that is the end, <laughs> you know, so, yes. and then when I, when I think about the end result of working in industry, um, the end result, um, you know, specifically for me and the company I work at, our end result is, you know, developing a pharmacokinetic or an immunogenicity assay so that um, we can, you know, analyze, um, analyze um, drug candidates of our clients. So that's kind of a, you know, it's a step to getting towards that end goal um, of getting a drug to market um, to help people. So this is really, you know, it's really a direct, um, it could really be like a a direct impact on society that you maybe make a small contribution to, but um, Mm. even a small contribution is better to little to no contribution, which is what I feel most, at least my, personal academic research went into and that's even you know I published in quite high impact journals um, you know high as in um, you know chemical reviews which is a very high impact factor I published in that and um, they're just really um, I really realized even doing that there's not a lot of um, at least what I felt was a lot of impact um, towards um, you know your work in science yeah so um, yeah yeah yeah, yeah, the the, higher you know and and I I wanted to jump right into that just because I know yeah. uh, we have uh, uh, time constraints. I wanted to ask you about the hiring process. So you, you had some challenges in getting hired into your first R&D role. What were those challenges? And then what do you think helped you along the way? Like how did you, you know, what, I, what parts of the process uh, kind of stuck out to you as being difficult? And what did you learn along the way that helped you overcome uh, that to, to get your first, into your first role? Um, yeah, well, certainly the most difficult process or the most, the biggest step is just, um, you know, getting a call back, getting a response, um, mm. you know, whether you're, you know, uh, whether you're trying to, um, you know, network with, uh, you know, somebody who works at the company or with a recruiter from the company, it's very difficult um, to get that first response then to get your resume in there and then, um, you know, get it in the hands of a, recruiter, you know, who then usually sends it, in my experience, to a hiring manager, that was certainly the most, um, the most difficult step. And the way I overcame it really was I, I kind of, um, I just kind of went at it from, from all different angles. Um, my primary goal was to recruit, or not to recruit, but only to uh, network to recruiters and other people to try and use that. And I was noticing that, like, it was taking quite a while to get responses from people when you're trying to network, reach out, um, you know, go meet people. It was taking a while and I was seeing these positions. I felt I was very qualified for just kind of uh, disappear. So I kind of set a little timeline. Like if I can't get through to someone in like, you know, two to four weeks, 
I'm yes. just going to apply online and, you know, it's better like, you know, you got, I might have 0.1% chance, but it's better than 0% mm. chance, you know? And when I started doing that, like I started getting, um, I started getting, I don't want to say a whole bunch, but you know, I got a, I got a few more, you know? Um, yeah. and I found that I was, I found that, you know, um, I was getting, I received rejections from very strong referrals. You know, I even received crickets, uh, which is no response at all from yeah. very strong referrals who actually forwarded my resume to hiring managers. Um, so I found like, you know, um, I was, I was getting, I was getting my foot in the door for some interviews and some, some discussion. So that's what, um, yeah, that's what really helped me just getting more opportunities. And then, yeah. um, as far as the, yeah, as far as the whole, like, you know, I used all of your, all of cheeky scientists, um, information about, you know, industry presentations, interview strategies and, and everything like that to, to, to really help. And I think, um, I think the best, I think I finally, I, I attribute it, you know, um, probably 60 to 70% to that and 30% just to luck to, um, to find an, a hiring manager who was willing to take somebody who didn't, who might've had relevant experience, but not industry experience. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, that yeah. was often, yeah, the, the hurdle is getting into industry the first time I felt like for me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's the great thing. You never have to go back to not having industry experience again once you get in. Um, but at the same time, if yeah, you don't yeah. have industry experience, you, you know, that's okay. 90% of the PhDs that come into our association have no industry experience and uh, you can get hired. And just to recap a couple of other things that Evan said, you can't let rejection get you down. Instead, you just have to increase your strategies and to attack things from all angles. Uh, you don't just rely on uploading resumes or just rely on referrals or just rely on networking events. You do all of these things and you keep track of them and you multiply them and proliferate. And, and then, you know, the result is you get hired, just like Evan said. Any final comments, Evan? Um, no, Isaiah. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was, it was great to talk to you again. Yeah. yeah good, to, good to talk to you too. And I really appreciate your time. Please uh, do me a favor and thank Evan for coming on in the chat box. Uh, we appreciate our guests coming on, especially in the middle of a work day. Great to, great to have you on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. I really appreciate it, and I'll hope to, hope to see you on LinkedIn. Perfect. Yeah, please reach out if you would. And we're going to jump in right to our third and final guest. Uh, I'm going to show my screen here so that we can put up her bio. We have on Natalie. Uh, she completed her PhD in biomedical science at the University of New Mexico and currently works as a scientist, one at Biomarin Pharmaceuticals. Um, uh, there she is a part of a trans translational biology team working to turn creative ideas into cutting edge solutions for patients and rare disease. Uh, she's on LinkedIn as well. So please reach out. And if you do send a message, uh, something nice and uh, thank her for her time, uh, maybe mention something that she's going to talk about here uh, shortly. So welcome, Natalie. How are you? It's good. Let me see if I can get you up on the big screen here. And you sound a little bit far away. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. I might be a little quiet because I'm, it is in the middle of my work day. So That's I okay. It might help without the, I think it might be louder without the mic. If you, you, could, you can probably talk at the same level and try it without the mic. Do you want to try that? Or am I, is my voice going to be too loud? No, I think it'll be fine. You see that, yeah, sometimes the mics like really lower the voice instead of... Um, but we can make do either way. Oh, no, no, I can't hear you at all. <laughs> That's all right. We'll figure it out. This is just the, the 15th technical difficulty today. Most of them were on my end, so we can, we can definitely support. Okay, so is it that my microphone that sounds really low right now? Can you hear my voice now? Yeah, it's really low. Um, That's with the microphone? Yeah, hold on really quick. Let me see. Maybe if you hold the mic right up to your um, mouth, that might work. Let's try that. How is that? Can you hear me better now? Try again. With my mic right. Oh, in much better. That's much better. Yes. Well, I'll thank talk you. to you guys with my microphone right in front of my face. Just like this. Yeah, like a, like a harmonica. There we go, guys. <laughs> no, it's okay, Natalie. Thank you so much for coming on in the middle of a work day. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Not a problem. Thanks for asking me on again. It's always great to give back to a group that gave me so much. Yeah. And I want to jump into the, I think the, 
the best question that we kind of discussed before the show, which is, you know, how are your priorities different in industry now than what they were? I want to get through all the other questions too, but that's the big one. You know, how are your priorities different in industry than what they were in academia? This is a great question. So in academia, there was a lot about the journey because you were a student or you were a trainee and how are you going to get this done? What can we do? Can we save $100 here or there? The point of industry is get to the answer. Get to the answer fast, get to the answer cleanly, because we need to know for this project or for this possible therapeutic, what is the best way to do it? And we're also in competition with people. So you are in competition in academia with different labs and getting scoop for a paper, but now the competition is millions of dollars. It's patients with rare disease, which is what I work on, who need a cure and need a cure now. So for me, it's not about maybe having the most perfect, beautiful dose response curve with 30 different points in it, right? And I just had a meeting with this with one of my project leaders. It's about take a couple points. Is this quick and clean? What is our answer? Where do we move next in the pipeline? So that's really different. And that's something going from academia, something that you need to be aware of is that while you can really get into the details and dive into that, and that's perfectly reasonable in academia because you'll always get a paper, that's not going to help you in industry. We have windows. And if you try to present to the research committee and you don't have that data yet, it's like you never did it. So how do I get this done quick? How do I get this done clean? This is why we have so many instrumentations and we pay the money that we do to get the exact reagents that we want because we know it'll work the first time. So that's mm -hmm. been a really big change for me. And I really enjoyed it because it's a breakneck pace and we get a lot of answers really fast. Now, I think that's important. And, and you know, a lot of you are probably thinking, oh, well, isn't, doesn't that sacrifice quality? You know, and, and so I'm glad you use like a dose response curve or like, like, like a titration, right? right? As mm -hmm. Sometimes as scientists in that want to get the titration curve exactly right before we actually do the real experiment that's going to matter. We're not talking about something that's going to be, you know, put into patients as the, the end, you know, the end result experiment that matters. Um, so I think you learn to make better judgments about what matters and what doesn't, and you have more checkpoints and checklists in place in industry so you can move faster without sacrificing quality. Can you, want, you want to talk a little bit more about that just to yeah. drive it home? Make no mistake that we are not sacrificing quality here. In fact, something that we like to say, we really hate the, the cliche term quick and dirty. We want quick and clean. Mm -hmm. We want well-designed, we want clever designs, and we want to know that we have an answer that we trust. So mm -hmm. firstly, this is why we hire extremely qualified candidates, because we obviously trust the level of their work and we know that they can do the science. Mm -hmm. Secondly, based on that, we want to know the answers for a yes or a no. So if I'm going in, will those 10 extra points on the curve really help me with my yes or no answer? Or will five points on the curve help me with my yes or no answer? This is how you have to think. Would it look beautiful on the publication? I'll bet it would. I'll bet it would. But when I need to get up and go to the research committee and the steering committee and the CEOs and show, look, if we give compound X and we see a turnaround in symptom Y, this is why we believe that this is a candidate that should proceed in the pipeline versus candidate A, which we don't, we don't see the same robust response. Those are the answers that you're looking for. You're not here solely to get a publication, right? You're here to get a therapeutic. You're here to get a product. And so mm -hmm. You change your, the way you think a little bit. You're still a great scientist. You're still a thorough scientist, but you're making sure that you're a very efficient scientist. Mm, well said. And, uh, you know, I want to stay on that note and, and ask you a little bit to maybe think about what you can never go back to. You know, now that you've been on the other side, if you had to go back to academia, like what, is, what are some of the things that you could just never deal with again, right? Because you can't put the genie back in the bottle old phrasing that just basically means now that you've experienced something better in, in certain ways, you couldn't go back to, to what was now as with your perspective, extremely difficult. What, what would those things be? So when I was in academia, I had to do the whole darn thing from start to finish, right? I would have to maybe get synthesize my own antibody. I'd have to get it then into cell culture. We have teams for that. This gives me time to think about the big picture and the big idea. And mm -hmm. I get more time to look at the end goals, right? I'm not caught up on, I don't know if I'm going to be able to dose today. Let me go trick-or-treating for this. I have all my reagents here. We have people that are specialists in what they do so that we can get the data fast. 
And boy, that would be tough sometimes to go back into academia and think about the crawling pace that you might have. So that, that yeah. would be hard. I, I, it made me a better person. I appreciate it. And I get a lot of respect from the team because I have a lot of in vivo and in vitro experience. Mm. So I know what it's like to design those scientists. So I don't regret those grueling days in the postdoc where you did it all yourself. Right. But I'm glad I don't have to do it again. Yeah, exactly. And I think, I, I think that's a, a, it's great insight, right? Because once you've been on both sides, your perspective is going to be different. And I'm curious now that you're on the other side too, let's say, you know, tomorrow you have to hire somebody or start hiring somebody on your team, you know, to work with you in an R and D position. What are some of the key things you're going to look for right away? And what are some of the, on the other end of it, the non-negotiables things you just couldn't, couldn't put up with? Oh my gosh, you might, how do you know that we actually had to hire somebody about a month ago? I'm sharing a research assistant with another scientist. So I was on the other side of the table just Fantastic. a while ago. So for me, now that I'm on the other side, technical proficiency is very big deal. Um, I can look at a resume and look at that and a very clean resume. Mm. If I see a jumbled resume with way too much detail, unfortunately now I'll be prejudiced to think that you're getting so caught up in some of the details here that what if that ha happens in your work and you want to do 82 points on your dose response curve? So a beautiful resume that shows you know how to communicate well for me when I'm just screening. And we get hundreds of applicants for a single job. Yeah. So when we have to go through and look through some of these, like, I admit it, I'm tired. I've been looking at the same terms over and over again. So... I want to see that you communicate really well. And once I see that you have your skills done with the first few questions, the next biggest thing for me is culture fit. Mm. We're going to be working together a lot. We're going to be in a lot of meetings. We're going to have stressful deadlines. And I need to know you get along. There are a lot of wonderfully competent scientists out there, and I think that's important and valuable. But I want to know you get along with the team. And we spend so much time and money interviewing candidates and going through the process and onboarding them we don't want first of all for the candidate to feel uncomfortable when they get here or for us to feel uncomfortable when a candidate accepts a position we want to get along and we want to gel because you need to work as a well-oiled machine in industry to get your results fast and so culture fit now is actually a really big deal to me and it should be a big deal to candidates too. You don't want to be where you're not wanted. You don't want to be where you might feel uncomfy. So don't forget you're interviewing them as much as us. <laughs> yeah. Great points. Uh, I do want to ask you one more question. You know, I guess if you could zoom out and you were talking to yourself, you know, five years ago or you know, a month before you got hired, or whatever your darkest hour would have been maybe, uh, what, what advice would you give yourself in the job search specifically for getting into the type of role that you're in now in R&D? Ugh. I had a very low point a few weeks before I got hired where they said that they were going to take me as a research associate and at the last minute backed out and said they'd just extend my postdoc. Mm -hmm. And so I was literally actually, I was physically in tears at some points coming home from work realizing it wasn't going to end. If I could go back to that person, I would look at them and just really shake myself by the shoulders and say, do not doubt that you are valuable. Mm -hmm. Like never doubt that you are mm. valuable and make sure you keep that confidence that you are valuable because that confidence in who you are and your skill set and what you can contribute to a scientific team is mm. very apparent when you network. And as we mm. all know, networking is very important. So keep your head up, do not doubt your value and make sure that you're putting that value and that confidence into your networking because it, it, you can tell. Now that I'm on the other side of things and I'm networking with people and I see them add value to me or see them confident in what they can do, it makes a big difference. So no, don't doubt your value. Know that you're worth. Don't relegate yourself and say, guess I'm gonna take this third or fourth postdoc. You don't have to. Be confident, know your value, reflect mm. that value in how mm. you interact and network with others. Don't forget to reflect your value. Well said. Thank you so much, Natalie, for your time. I really appreciate it. And thanks for encouraging everyone listening. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Isaiah. Thanks. Please thank Natalie in the chat box, if you would. Really appreciative to have her on as well as other guests. Had a great lineup, different roles, all in R&D, though, very different backgrounds, different struggles. But as you can see, 
whether you've done a postdoc or haven't done a postdoc or have, you know, if you don't have industry experience or you need a visa, whatever issue you're facing, you can get into an R&D position and things are better in R&D. Okay. You don't need more academic training. You need to get on the job training. It's time for you to get hired. If you're watching this, if you're listening to this, um, that's the step we know you want to take. So we hope you will. Uh, the last thing we want to say for those of you watching us on the public stream, it's been great having you with us. If you want to learn more about getting hired, go to phdsgethired.com. You can put your name and email address. We'll send you all of our free materials. Until then, we'll see you on another Cheeky Scientist radio show soon. Thanks, everyone. This takes us to the end of another Cheeky Scientist radio show podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you want to learn more about transitioning into your first or next job in industry, just go to phdsgethired.com. Go to phdsgethired.com. We will send you all of our free training materials that will help you start your job search now or help you take it to the next level in business. As always, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional. Pump up the bass. Let's <laughs> go.